magnetic resonance imaging. Magnetic resonance imaging tells us exactly what it is. It is imaging using a giant magnet of resonance. What is resonance? Resonance is vibration, and the resonating uh, substrate of MRI is the proton. This proton is hydrogen. It happens to be a very good anatomic substrate for NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance, also known as MRI, because you are a lot of hydrogen. Most of your hydrogen is in water. It is the H in H2O. So each of these tiny hydrogens has a net magnetic uh, vector, a dipole moment. And under normal circumstances, your hydrogens are all pointing in different directions. And therefore, you have no net magnetic vector. However, when you enter into the giant magnetic field of, say, one Tesla, all of your little magnets will align inside of the giant magnetic field. At that point, radio frequency pulse can be given to impart energy to the system that will flip the protons into the transverse plane. When we turn off this radio frequency pulse, the protons will return to their static equilibrium state that will give off energy, which we can measure as signal intensity. So the language of MR is signal intensity, hyper-intense, hypo-intense, iso-intense, because intensity is the language of MRI, as opposed to CT, where the parameter is density. So, Knowing that hydrogen and water is the anatomic substrate of MRI, you can then weight the study towards time constant one or time constant two. And by weighting the study, all we're doing is changing the parameters of the acquisition of the signal. And so things that are bright on T2 tend to have a lot of water in them because proton density is the determining factor on the signal intensity on T2. So T2 is a water study, and because most of the pathology that we encounter in the brain brings water with it, things that are bright on T2 are usually pathology. Now, we have a problem on T2 because there's this other substance in the brain that has a lot of water that is not pathologic, it's normal, and that is cerebrospinal fluid. So the cerebrospinal fluid is very bright on T2. So we would like to have a sequence that can attenuate or reduce the fluid signal. And we can do that using an inversion recovery sequence. So when we use inversion recovery to attenuate the fluid, in this case, the cerebrospinal fluid, we call that flare. So the T2 CSF signal can be attenuated using fluid attenuation inversion recovery, also known as flare. T1, in contrast to T2, is the anatomy study. And the reason it's the anatomy study is there are some things that are just naturally bright, hyper-intense on T1, like fat. And it provides us very good differentiation in signal intensity without giving any contrast material. However, the bad part is fat is bright on T1, but it's too bright. So just like CSF is too bright on T2, fat is bright on T1. And so we'd like to use an inversion recovery to attenuate the fat signal. And that is called short ter taw inversion recovery sequence or fat suppression or fat sa saturation. So fat sat and fat suppression, stir, all of these are fancy ways for suppressing the fat signal and reducing the signal on T1. You do not have to order T1 and T2. It just comes automatically with the study. The study is automatically weighted towards T1, time constant one, and T2. However, you need to consider ordering the suppression sequences, flare for T2, and fat saturation for T1, so that we can take away the normal bright signal of normal things that are bright or dark on T1 and T2. In addition, we have to give the gadolinium contrast material. So gadolinium is a paramagnetic uh, material that will enhance the local magnetic field. So when we give gadolinium, it will make things look more hyper-intense if there's breakdown or lack of the blood-brain barrier. So some normal structures in the orbit, which do not have a blood-brain barrier, like the extraocular muscles, will enhance. The cora will enhance. But the optic nerve, which is central nervous system does have a blood brain barrier and therefore will not enhance under normal conditions. So if we see enhancement of the optic nerve after gadolinium, we know that we have pathology there. We know we have breakdown of the blood brain barrier and the enhancement that we're looking for is on T1. Gadolinium post-confidence. 
So now that you know how the protons work and how the signal intensity of MR works in the giant magnet, you should know that fast moving blood produces no signal. So if the proton is moving too quickly, it'll, it won't get a chance to align in the magnetic field. And that will create a void in the signal, which we call a flow void. So a void in the signal created by rapidly flowing blood means that high flow arterial blood, for example, in the internal carotid artery, is going to be dark on all sequences. It'll be hypo intense, dark on T1 and on T2. And after gadolinium, before gadolinium, it'll all be dark. And that flow void is how we can tell that we are dealing with an arterial high flow uh, blood. So the basics of MR, proton, water, weight to study, T1, T2. Some things are bright on T2, like water. Some things are bright on T1, like fat. We can suppress the normal signal with flare on CSF, T2, and fat saturation on T1. Always give the gadolinium, and we can see a high, fast moving blood as a flow void uh, in all sequences.